I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. We thought we would commemorate the day and um, learn a little bit about a very important time in American history and perhaps what we ourselves can learn from it for today in conversation with Professor John Mosier. I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and I'm glad to welcome you to this special webinar. It's part of Ashbrook's uh, series of programs, which we do both here on Ashland University's campus and across the country, as many of you know, for students, teachers, and citizens. And this is part of that engagement outreach to all of those today. And we wanna welcome students who are with us, um, supporters and citizens from around the country, and of course, teachers who are joining us through the Teaching American History program which is a really vital part of what Ashbrook is doing all across the country. So thank you today. We, we see this program as we do with all of our programs as really part of our mission, which is to uh, strengthen constitutional self-government by educating our fellow Americans on the history and principles of our country. And we really believe at Ashbrook that we do that best as an educational center through conversation because we don't think of education, as I've often said, as information simply, and we don't think of it uh, certainly not as indoctrination, but as thinking, as discovering the truth for yourself. And we find the really the best way to do that is through conversation. So we want to invite you all who are attending with us today into that conversation. Please send your, your questions, and I know there will be many, for, uh, for John through the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. This is an important topic in American history, and uh, always, uh, John, we had John on previously for our D-Day seminar back in June, and he said, hey, I'd love to come back and do Pearl Harbor with you, so um, we had to have him come back to do that. Those of you who are not familiar with Professor John Mosier, who we're going to be in conversation with today. John is Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Ashland University. Um, John's been at Ashland almost 20 years now, right? Yeah, so, it'll be 20 years in August. Okay, there you go. So been with us a long time. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree from Ohio University, although he is a native of Western Pennsylvania occasionally reminds us of that during football season, uh, particularly this one. <laughs> got his know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got his master's and PhD from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, he was a, a graduate student there with our friend Dan Monroe, who we have, have had on before as well, and a good friend of John's. John is the not only the chair of the Department of History and Political Science, but also chair of the MAG program, our Master of Arts in American History and Government, and um, teaches classes in the MAG, um, a number of classes he's taught, a, a couple of which he's taught the Progressive Era and post-war America, especially really John specializes in the 20th century, 20th century American history, but also the relationship between America and other parts of the world in the 20th century. He's taught uh, undergraduate classes for us in 20th century America, teaches a very popular World War II class for our Ashbrook scholars, and also uh, a class on modern East Asia. So John is really uh, teaching right in the wheelhouse here of the events of 1941. And he has gone around the country for us, teaching in our Teaching American History uh, seminars. He's done events on the Cold War, uh, seminars with teachers on the Cold War, and on 20th century America. And in fact, one of the really interesting places that John does these TH seminars is on the USS Midway in San Diego Harbor. So uh, again, a great World War II site. And probably a place where you wish you were today, right? San Diego sounds awfully nice today. Yeah, right? <laughs> so John is a, is a tremendous expert on World War II. He has uh, led a number of Ashbrook trips, actually, with students to Europe and to the battle sites of World War II, to Normandy, to Western Europe, um, and also to, to England. So John has covered the whole range of it from the scholarly point of view and taken students there in person. 
written a number of, of publications, two really good books uh, on 20th century history. One is called Twisting the Lion's Tail, American Anglophobia Between the World Wars, about the American relationship with and perhaps suspicion of Great Britain during the 20th century. And then a, a recent book, The Global Great Depla Depression and the Coming of World War II. So John, thank you for coming, being with us today on this topic. I'm so pleased to be here. Tell us, take us back a little bit. A lot of us know something, of course, about World War II, uh, but for America, World War II starts December 7th, 1941. But obviously the world is already engaged in a cataclysmic global war. Take us back to the months before 1941. Yeah. What's the strategic situation around the world and particularly in the Pacific? Yeah, you, if, I mean, if you ask an American when World War II started, they're likely to say December 1941. You ask a European and they're likely to say September 1939. You ask an East Asian, they're likely to say uh, July 1937 because even though it was not a declared war, Japan and China had been fighting consistent, consistently ever since, uh, ever since that point. And that is, is, is ultimately what led to uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, if you can believe it. So if we go back, you say, go back, how far do we go back? Well, November is, might be a, a, a good place to start because November really marks the passing of the last point at which the differences between the United States and Japan could have been settled amicably. Um, in November, the Japanese issued what they referred to as a modus vivendi, right? This is just a deal. It's not a final agreement. It's just how we can keep getting along. And the, 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 the issue was the decision by the, uh, the Roosevelt administration in July of 1941 to freeze Japanese assets in the United States, which had the effect of preventing Japan from purchasing any, anything from the United States. And uh, Japan was highly dependent on the United States for a number of resources, most importantly, oil. Uh, obviously, oil was pretty important then, just as it is today. Uh, without the without American oil, it would have been impossible for Japan to continue its war in China, and this is actually why the uh, the the administration had put the order into place. They wanted to basically uh, uh, force Japan to give up its its campaign of aggression in Asia. So at, at that point, I mean, starting in in the summer the Japanese policy was twofold. On the one hand, they were going to engage in intensive negotiations with the United States to try to get them to back away from that order, while at the same time preparing for war uh, in case the diplomacy in case the, the diplomacy failed. And this was part of the problem for the diplomacy because it turned out that the United States had broken Japan's diplomatic code. So when the Japanese said, we are setting a deadline of November 22nd for negotiations, right? The, the military code was not broken at this point, that happened later. But when you learn via diplomatic messages that there's a deadline for negotiations, that leads you to say, well, what's supposed to happen after that deadline? Well, it's pretty clear that it was, some, it was gonna be something dire. Well, November was uh, it was when the uh, the Japanese government issued this final modus vivendi, which was an offer to say, all right, we will withdraw from southern Indo French Indochina, which they had occupied in in July, and we will accept U.S. mediation to end the war in uh, to end the war in China. Uh, but in return, the United States has to uh, end its trade sanctions and sell Japan what it needs. And there's evidence that the administration actually took this deal seriously, but ultimately for a couple of reasons decided to reject it. For one, uh, FDR took the, took the plan to Chiang Kai-shek in China. Unsurprisingly, Chiang said, this is, if you do this, you're selling us out. And ran it by Winston Churchill too. And Winston Churchill said, "This, if you buy into this, this is this sounds like appeasement, right?" And and when by 1941, if Churchill says something is appeasement, you take that you, you take that seriously. Uh, the other reason was, as as I mentioned before, uh, 
the Japanese code had been broken and they knew about the deadline, which led to the accusation among some of the administration that, that the Japanese weren't really negotiating in good faith, that they were just trying to drag things out until they could get ready for an attack. So on November 2nd, the response to the, uh, uh, November 22nd, the United States issued its response to the Japanese proposed modus vivendi, which basically said, how about this? You guys withdraw from China and we'll start selling you and promise not to attack anyone else and we'll start selling you oil again. Not only was that a rejection of the modus vivendi, but the Japanese uh, government saw that as a slap in the face. Um, and, and, and I think this really where is where it, it reflects a lack of understanding of, of the Japanese on the part of the administration. The extent to which Japan was committed heart and soul to the campaign in China. It was not uncommon to hear the war in China referred to as a holy war. Uh, you don't give that, and, and, and by this time, there had been something like, like 100,000 Japanese casualties. And in what economists always call sunk cost fallacy, how can we think about giving up this war without disgracing the memory of those 100,000 men who have, uh, who have died? So that, with simply withdrawing from, from China was a non-starter. Uh, and days after, uh, just a couple of days after the US rejection came, uh, a task force of aircraft carriers and with a couple of battleships and all sorts of other supporting craft uh, left, uh, left the Yokosuka Naval, Naval Base and, um, and made this arduous trip across the Pacific Ocean. Was it a slow, steady decline in American-Japanese relations um, over, let's say, the late 30s into 41? Or yeah. was it things were looking pretty good and then took a precipitous drop? Uh, they hadn't been good for some time. I mean, as early as 1931, when the Japanese occupied Manchuria, uh, the United States wasn't going to do anything about it. In fact, no country did anything about it uh, because it's the middle of the Depression. No one was, no one was, was looking to, 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 to uh, start a war. Uh, so Japan was allowed to was allowed to control Manchuria, although the United States were simply refused to recognize it. And uh, soon afterward, the uh, uh, Japan walked out of the League of Nations. It started to repudiate the naval arms limitation treaties it had enter, entered into with the United States and Great Britain. Um, but the big turning point is 1937, when the when the war in China breaks out again. <laughs> FDR's options are limited. The American people have, uh, this, is, this is sometimes uh, something I, I always feel like I have to explain to students. This is not the time when anything happens in the world, the United States feels compelled to, <laughs> compelled to intervene somehow. There was no support in the United States for a war in, in, in East Asia, although there was overwhelming sympathy for China. In, the, uh, uh, in this conflict. The US position was, well, we're going to impose uh, an arms embargo and, ish and make loans uh, and, pr and, and providing economic aid to the Chinese government. And that was really the extent of US involvement in the war between China and Japan. Uh, but from the Japanese perspective, that was bad enough. And if you study the war between China and Japan from 1937 to 1939, it's, it's the Japanese army winning battle after battle after battle, occupying more and more of the country. But guess what? China's really big and the Japanese army is not big enough to overrun the country. So the Japanese are increasingly frustrated. Why won't Chiang Kai-shek see reason and understand what we really are going for here? And, and maybe at some point I could talk about what, what Japan really wanted out of China. But the fact is, uh, the Chinese wouldn't back down, and the Japanese concluded, why are they doing this? Well, they're, Chiang Kai-shek is, is so stubborn because he's getting aid from the aid and encouragement from the United States. Um, and, and so that, then you had the U.S., sorry, the Japanese occupation of northern Indochina in 1940, southern Indochina in 1941, and again and again, the administration responds with uh, trade sanctions. Because really, that was the only card FDR, FDR had to play. And it's an effective card because Japan is so dependent on US exports. But at the same time, it's a dangerous card because 
if you put the Japanese, it turns out if you put the Japanese into a situation, if they have to decide between giving up the war in China and going to war against the United States, they're going to choose the latter option. What's their assessment of America such that they decide to choose that option and not only decide to choose that option, but attack in this particularly spectacular way? What do they think of the FDR administration? What do they think of the American people? What do they think about the country? Do they, they think they can win this if they start it this way? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. For what, I mean, because the question of why the Japanese would attack the United States, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a fascinating question because they had to know that their chances were not great of winning. Um, you know, you could you could look for some to this Bushido ethic, right? There were some in Japan, some ultranationalists who said, "Look, it doesn't matter what they have; we could win even if we fight with bamboo spears." But but those are a few crazies, right? I mean, General Tojo was a pretty clear-eyed realist about uh, uh, about these things. Admiral Yamamoto was a pretty clear-eyed realist about these things. The 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 the, the, the gradual decision the decision that was taken into Tokyo to go to war was taken um, with a great deal of trepidation. It was only after the Japanese leadership became convinced that every other option was worse that the decision that, that, that they made the decision for war, and they knew that there that, that that there was a very good chance they would lose they would lose that war. Um, but the one shot they had at victory, Yamamoto made this argument. By the way, Yamamoto said, I don't think you should actually do this, <laughs> but if you're going to do it, here is the one way that gives the one option that gives you a chance of winning. He looked back through Japanese naval history and said, we have historically done well when we have attacked with surprise. Uh, Port Arthur, when the, the Russo-Japanese War of, uh, of, of 1905 began with a surprise attack on the Russian uh, uh, Far Eastern fleet at, at Port Arthur. So we have to do something like this. Here is the expectation. So th the fear about attacking the United States was everybody knew that the United States had about in Japan, everyone who mattered in Japan, knew that the United States outproduced Japan by a factor of like 100 to 1. So if it became a long war, Japan was going to lose. So how do we get a quick war? We launch a surprise attack against the U.S. Pacific Fleet, which is the only naval force in the Pacific that is capable of interfering with our plans. Now, what are our plans? There's a whole other dimension to the Japanese strategy in 1941. On the same day that the attack on Pearl Harbor was launched, simultaneous offensives were to be carried out throughout Southeast Asia. And the goal of those offensives was to grab hold of what the Japanese called the Southern Resource Area, the Dutch East Indies, today Indonesia, uh, Burma, uh, Indochina they already had, um, uh, uh, Malaya and Singapore. Lots of oil resources, rubber resources, tin resources. Once we have those areas under our control, it's not going to matter that we're not getting the stuff from the United States anymore. That's going to be the source of our, our, of our resources now. But the attack on Pearl Harbor is necessary to prevent the, the U.S. Pacific Fleet from interfering with any of those other operations. We hit Pearl Harbor. We do, deal a devastating blow to the United States Pacific Fleet, and that's going to buy us time. The hope was six months. And in that course of that six months, we're not only going to win control of the Southern Resource Area, but we're going to grab up as many little islands in the Pacific between the United States and Japan as we possibly can. Now, what are we going to do with those islands? These, these were not resource areas. You're going to turn those islands into unsinkable aircraft carriers. We're going to put naval bases, we're going to put air bases on them. In some cases, if they have good harbors, we're going to put naval bases. We're going to fortify them. And at the end of that six-month window, once the, once the Americans have finally recovered from that blow, the, where they were, the Japanese were banking on the American people saying, hmm, look at that defensive position that the Japanese have built up. Look how they've been able, they're able to get these resources from other places. Is it really that important to us that the Japanese dominate East Asia? Nah, not so much, right? So the, so the attitude on the part of, say, the Japanese army and Japanese 
Japanese Navy was that was that Americans could produce a whole lot of stuff, but do they really have grit? If it, it, are they are, do they have the stomach for the kind of war it would take to drive us out of those drive us off those islands and carry the war to Japan? Uh, because the rap on Americans was they liked they liked uh, leisure, they were wealthy. They were kind of fat and happy. They existed on, on a diet that the average Japanese person would have killed to have. Uh, they like baseball and nightclubs and having a good time. And in the end, they're not going to be ter terribly serious about, uh, about fighting the war. And at that point, they'll say, OK. The Japanese like to say, our goal is an Asiatic Monroe Doctrine. That's why they really they couldn't get they, they couldn't understand why the United States cared so much about East Asia. Or, we're not messing with Latin America, the Japanese said. We understand that, that Latin America is an area of special interest from the United States. All we ask is that you respect that, that, that Japan has the, same, has the same in East Asia. And that, of course, is what the United States had, had failed to do ever since the 1890s. Why did the Americans care about East Asia? And why did the Roosevelt administration care about it? Um, well, I mean, long sta longstanding U.S. policy in, in uh, East Asia was based on the principle of the open door, um, that, that, that all countries should have commercial access on equal terms to China. As early as the 1890s, there's this lure of the China market, right? There are you know, millions and millions of Chinese people uh, who just, you know, it's as soon as that China develops enough, they're going to want to buy lots and lots of stuff. So, you know, the, the short answer, the, the short answer is not great, but the short answer is, 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 is trading opportunities. But it was more than that. Americans had developed kind of a paternal attitude toward, toward China. Uh, there was almost since the earliest days of the American Republic, American missionaries operated in, in China. Uh, and in fact, if you look at FDR himself, the, on the Delano side of his family, there were Chinese uh, Chinese missionaries. So he had a personal interest in uh, in this as 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 well. Um, so you know, I don't no administration I don't think would have been happy to see Japan dominate uh, dominate East Asia. Uh, the thing with with FDR's administration though is the Pacific is not even his focus. Right? His attention is riveted on Europe, and his idea in, in Japan was, well, let's sort of, the term they used was baby them along. Eventually, because, the, because uh, FDR and many in, in, the, in the Roosevelt administration believed that Japan's aggressiveness was being hatched in Germany. It's Hitler that's putting the Japanese up to this. Because by that time, they were in alliance? Uh, not, not formally until 1940, but that was the Tripartite Pact. But in 1936, they signed something called the, uh, uh, the Anti-Comintern Pact. So, so there, was, there, there were always suspicions in the United States that Germany and, the, Germany and Japan were working together more closely than they actually were. In fact, they weren't, they weren't working closely at all. But the suspicion, and part of this was, frankly, is based on racism, um, that, that the Japanese left to their own devices would not be really capable of this, uh, that the Germans are, the Germans are, are stirring them up. And, if, uh, and so FDR's hope is if we can delay things in the Pacific long enough, Germany will be, Hitler will be defeated. And once that happens, Japan will sweeten up. And, and, and a band and, and, uh, and, and new leaders will come to the fore that will recognize the essential madness of their strategy. That's, that's FDR's assessment of Japan and Japanese leadership. What's their assessment of FDR? Yeah, uh, how would they think of him in particular? Uh, I mean, they see him as dangerous. They see him as 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 working hand in glove with uh, with with Churchill, which was which was true. You know, ultimately, a big question. This came up when, in 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 late 1941. What we really need are the resources, since the Americans aren't going to sell it to us. If we can't get the Americans to sell it to us, let's just grab the southern resource area, snatch up those Dutch and English uh, and English colonies, 
And um, that'll, those will give us the resources we need and we don't have to touch the United States at all. Well, the position of the, of the Japanese Navy was, mm, the United States are so, the United States is so jungled up with, uh, with, with Great Britain that there's no way that the Roosevelt administration would allow us to overrun British colonies. And this was a, another serious, uh, a, a serious misapprehension on the part of the, uh, of the Japanese. It's like it never occurred to them that the United States, in order to intervene against Japan, would have to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war, right? This is back during those times when the, the quaint idea existed that a president needed a declaration of war to make a major military intervention somewhere. So it, it, this actually would have had the Japanese grab the southern resource area and left the United States alone. It's hard to imagine how FDR could have gone to Congress and said, well, I, I want to declare war to defend British and Dutch colonies in Asia. That's a non-starter. I mean, Americans didn't like didn't like European colonialism. They might like the British, right? They sympathize with the British when German bombs are raining down on London, but they don't sympathize with Britain's right to hold people in subjection in, in, in East Asia. And, and by the way, the Japanese love to play up this anti-colonial thing. Right? All we want is to liberate East Asia from, uh, West, from Western colonialism and Soviet communism too. And that played well. Now, it, it turns out that once the Japanese quote unquote liberated an area, uh, the people who lived there often wished that the Europeans were back because the Japanese were extremely brutal. But still, the, the, there, was a, uh, the, there was a certain appeal to what the Japanese were calling for. So there was, while there might have been really warm relations between FDR and Churchill, and FDR, as, you, as we know, was much more inter inclined to intervene in World War II before the Congress and certainly the American people were, what you're saying is, there, even though he might have been tempted to intervene had the Japanese just gone after British and Dutch colonies, the American people in Congress just would never have supported such a thing. Correct. If you look at, if you look at uh, American public opinion polls in, in late 1941, even regarding Europe, the, the, the opinion of the American people is very much, we need to give the British all the aid, they, all the aid we can to help them beat Germany, uh, but heck no, do we want to go to war? That, that comes through very strongly. When did the Japanese actually make the decision, pull the trigger and say, okay, we, our plan is going to be to attack and cripple the American Pacific fleet? When did they pull the trigger and actually begin the plan? Well, the, the, the planning for it, actually, there was actually planning in, in, in early, as early as 1940, early 1941. Right. This was this was in the works for a long time. Now, when you say pull the trigger, say we're actually going to do it. That's late. No, that's late November. But it, it was a, it was a complicated plan. Yamamoto apparently got the idea from uh, a, a, an attack by British carrier based aircraft on an Italian naval base at Toronto in 1940 which really did serious damage to the Italian Navy. And Yamamoto said, this is, this is a, a pattern for, for something we could do. But it took months of planning because um, every, I mean, the depth of Pearl Harbor was well known. And it was shallow enough that if you dropped torpedoes as they were normally dropped, they would hit the bottom of, of the harbor and explode ineffectively before. So if, if, if you're going to use the torpedoes against a ship, they go, they hit the water, they go down, and then they surface and travel and then, and then travel near the surface to hit their target. But Pearl Harbor was shallow enough that there was a real danger that those torpedoes would just hit the bottom before they would do any, uh, do any damage. So for months, Japanese pilots trained at a facility that was designed to be kind of a mock-up of Pearl Harbor trained at, at very low altitude approaches, releasing their torpedoes so they wouldn't descend very much, but would just kind of skip across the, uh, almost skip across the surface. So it was, it was, a, it was a matter of, 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 of a great deal of planning. How did the Japanese keep this secret during planning? Because one of the things you and I talked about in the D-Day um, uh, conversation was the amazing uh, lengths to which the Americans and British kept the D-Day operation at least where specifically it was going to happen, secret. 
everybody knew that there was going to be an invasion of Northwestern Europe by then, but nobody knew where or exactly when. But how did the Japanese keep this fact so quiet? Well, as I said, it, there was, it, it was known in the United States that there were, or it was strongly suspected that there were preparations for war going on. And by the way, when FDR announced that we're not going to accept this modus vivendi, he pretty, he, he pretty much knew the result was going to be war. Now, it never seemed to occur to him that there was going to be an attack on Pearl Harbor. That just seemed like an inc- that there's nothing that the Japanese could pull off. It was thought more likely that they were going to hit the Philippines or something, or something like that. Um, I guess the answer to your question is uh, there were some good crypto, uh, crypto analysts, right? So, so the, we, the, it was the the, uh, the U.S. was good at at breaking Japanese codes, but did not really have did not have agents operating in Japan, right? There's not not a very you know the United States did not have an advanced espionage network really anywhere. So, uh, so what went on in Japan? I mean, look, there were some observe, there were some things that you could observe. Best example I can give you: uh, you, the U.S. government knew when the Pearl Harbor Task Force left Yokosuka Naval Harbor or Naval Base, but then where it went, <laughs> they had, there was no idea. This was a huge uh, intelligence failure, keeping keeping tabs on where this big task force, right, six. Six aircraft carriers, two battleships, a bunch of smaller craft. A force does a force of that size doesn't leave without going to do something important. Um, they had practiced the route, not those literal ships, but uh, but a, 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 an empty passenger liner. Well, it had a crew, obviously. W- was sent across the jet, the Pacific Ocean on a route that it was believed would avoid any of the existing sea lanes. And the captain of that, that, that liner reported back that we made it to exactly this spot, you know, it's 100 miles from, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, Pearl, from Hawaii. We made the entire trip. We did not see a single ship or a single plane. So that was the, uh, the that made it, or, or that convinced uh, uh, Japanese naval planners that if we follow this route, it's not going to be detected. The, the task force is not going to be detected until it gets into position. What were some other intelligence failures by the United States? Well, the big one, uh, I mean, it all boils down to this. Pearl Harbor was not regarded as a, re- as, as a, as a feasible target. It's just it, it's a, like a third of the, the planet away from away from Japan. The idea that the Japanese could project force that far from home just would have was was dismissed. Although interestingly, some writers in the 1920s sort of did wrote speculative fiction, but were kind of military experts theorized about a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But it was not regarded as as as, as possible. So there was failure upon failure based on that. In the in the weeks, you know, starting for starting in November, there were regular uh, alerts sent out to all commands in the Pacific. Uh, in fact, there were so many of them that, that 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 there was a tendency to start. It was like the boy who cried wolf. Right? Um, but local commanders were free to interpret these alerts any way they wished, and the commanders at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Husband Kimball, Kimmel and General Walter Short uh, interpreted the alert as, okay, well, what do we really have to worry about at Pearl Harbor? Well, it's sabotage. Uh, there's a large uh, community of, 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 uh, of individuals of Japanese descent here. We don't know what their loyalty is. Uh, there could be Japanese spies operating or Japanese agents operating among them. The thing we have to fear most is that, uh, is, is that, that they're gonna be saboteurs. So how do you react to that? Well, the idea was we're going to get all of our aircraft and we're going to cluster them together on the runways. That makes it easy for us to post guards. It makes sense if you're worried about sabotage. If you're worried about an air attack, it is the worst possible strategy because they're all the planes are all clustered together. Same with the battleships. The battleships were, were moored at anchor so close to one another in a row. The, the lead Japanese plane, the, the flight leader, uh, um, uh, Fuchida, 
came diving out. He said later, we, I'd never seen anything like this. Ships that were so close together. It was like, you know, it was like shooting fish in a barrel for the Japanese, uh, for the Japanese pilots. And Kimmel and Short were court-martialed uh, as, as, as a result of this. So their argument was, well, you know, wow. We were supposed to think that there was going to be a, an air attack on, on Pearl Harbor. Nobody was claiming that there, there would be an air attack. We responded to what we thought was the, was the realistic threat, and that threat was going to be sabotage. I'll give you one more example of a, of a failure uh, to prepare. U.S. Um, there was radar in use for a couple hours a day. And uh, in, 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 at near Pearl Harbor, there was a radar set that was there, and just as the radar operators were about to shut down for the day, uh, they caught something heading toward Pearl Harbor, and said, "Oh, you know what? There's a flight of B-17s that are supposed to be arriving. That has to be them." And then they even called somebody, and they, their higher ups said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the B-17s. Don't worry about it." They shut down the they shut down the uh, uh, the radar and. Um, just minutes later, the attack, uh, uh, the attack began. Wow. Um, we're getting some really great questions coming in about this part of the conversation. And, and one of them wants to know, um, the, on the Japanese side, you already mentioned that Admiral Yamamoto, who was sort of probably the most famous Japanese naval uh, officer, in, at least if you look at popular fiction and movies and things, um, you, you mentioned Tojo. Uh, we haven't talked anything about the emperor and this questioner wants to know in thinking of in the japanese thinking yeah now is now we have to attack the, Jap the americans they left us no other choice what's the relationship between yamamoto tojo and the emperor in theory the emperor's authority was absolute had he said i do not i i, I forbid you to go to war it would have to be, that order would have to be obeyed. But for him to issue such an order would have been unusual. First of all, let me say that, that, that the role of the emperor in all this has been hotly debated over the years. Um, there, was, there was outrage in the United States after the war when the decision was made to keep the, keep the emperor because he was plainly associated with this, uh, with this, this attack. Um, MacArthur, Macar uh, Douglas MacArthur was a strong advocate of keeping the emperor. He said, my job in, in, in commanding the occupying force in Japan will be much easier if we can rule th kind of through the, uh, through the emperor. The emperor's our position was that I, you know, it would have been highly unusual for any emperor to intervene forcefully like that that by tradition, the emperor is isolated from the most critical decisions because if those decisions go badly, nobody wants the emperor to be blamed, right? This, this might be, sound really weird, but the imperial institution was so important to Japan. It was assumed that the emperors had been in an unbroken line going back thousands of years and True, as far as we can trace, it was the same family that that that, uh, that the emperors came from, and the argument was it, 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 the the imperial line originated in the sun goddess Amaterasu, right? So the emperor was div was a divine figure. Japan, th there was an idea of that. Called Japanese exceptionalism. We are different from the rest of the world because every other country has had turmoil and revolutions, uh, dynasties come and go, governments come and go. Only in, it's not that there's never been a change in Japan, but Japan's emperors have ruled in an unbroken line for, thou for thousands of years. But the fear is there's going to be danger to that line if the emperor becomes closely associated with it with any controversial decision because that decision the result might end up going uh, going badly so traditionally the emperor would be in the background he would meet with the leaders maybe make some cryptic statement but ultimately it's the cabinet it's the supreme command that makes the decisions there are some historians that say the emperor was very much involved in these in these decisions but in a way where he could offer a, a, a plausible deniability you won't find any documents that so that the that, that the emperor is was on was on board with this you won't find any documents saying that he stood in the way either but his but his argument was 
if I had really tried to stop it, I could well have been assassinated. That's a really okay. The government of Japan at the time, for those who don't know, describe it a little bit. It's not it's not an elected government like FDR and his administration. How, how does Tojo and others actually come to power and hold their power? Yeah, the the uh, the. The, the Japanese constitution of the 1880s was based on the constitution of Imperial Germany. Uh, the emperor was, a, a, was, was, was an, in theory, an absolute monarch. But the ones with the real, who were responsible for, for political decision making were uh, the cabinet. Um, and the cabinet was, there was a prime minister appointed by the emperor and, and then other cabinet ministers that are appointed by the prime, by the prime minister. There was an elected diet in Japan. In fact, 1940, there were in 1942 reasonably free elections to the diet in Japan. The thing is the diet didn't have any power by then. At one point around the 1910s, it looked like uh, you know, the, the emperor was, uh, was in the habit of choosing prime ministers whom he knew were acceptable to the parties in the diet. Uh, starting in the early 1930s, that, that went out the window. Nobody cared about the diet. The diet existed. They argued. You'd even, even occasionally hear anti-war sentiment expressed in the, uh, in, in the diet, although that became increasingly dangerous. Um, but yeah, but the, but the decisions were being made in, in, in the cabinet and in the Supreme Command. That is, the, uh, the chiefs of staff of the army and the navy had tremendous power. They were answerable only to the emperor. Um, it, the cabinet, most of the cabinet, I don't think knew that there was going to be that, that a, there was going to be an attack on Pearl Harbor. They understood there was going to be a war, but the decision of how that was going to be done that was entirely the Supreme Command. Um, so that's yeah, the the, the the cabinet, the Supreme Command, and the Emperor are the sources of political authority in in Japan in 1941. And and the Emperor either participates in or acquiesces to the attack. It's driven by the, those figures, as you said. Who are some of the important strategic thinkers? And we're building up to the day of Pearl Harbor and the attack, but who, who craft this idea, this amazing sort of unimaginable attack to the Americans at least? And it's interesting to me, it seems like that's a theme in American history, even thinking of 9-11. American, oftentimes when there have been these uh, surprise, terrible surprise attacks, it's kind of a failure to imagine that our enemies could really actually do that thing. Yeah, yeah. Who, come, who are the strategic thinkers on the Japanese side who get credit or blame for, for this? Yeah, it's, it's mainly Yamamoto, um, who, who uh, I, I mean, he, he had flashes of brilliance. He also, there, a, a big um, uh, failing on the part of Yamamoto was not to realize that the Americans took their carriers out of Pearl Harbor. That, that, that information was not secret. Um, one of the people look at Pearl Harbor and say one of the reasons why the attack on Pearl Harbor was not as devastating as it could have been was that the aircraft carriers were gone. And it would turn out that the aircraft carrier was a far more important weapon of war in World War II than certainly the rather outdated battleships that were that the United States kept at, uh, at, at Pearl Harbor. The, the, the odd thing is that, is that uh, Yamamoto should have been aware that the carriers were had, had, had left, but but he didn't seem to be. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard for me. I, I I really can't think of another figure of 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 comparable importance who designed it. Of course, he had a planning staff that he that he, that he worked with, but I don't I don't have any individual names for you there. The the day of the attack, what's the situation like in Hawaii for the Americans? What's the day like um, on December seventh, nineteen forty one? Uh, and who's in command of the Americans at the time? I think you mentioned them, but tell, just tell us a little bit about what that actual day is like. It's a Sunday morning in Hawaii. The weather was beautiful. I said, oh, it's always beautiful in Hawaii, right? Um, it, it, was, it was a Sunday morning, so uh, a lot of people were, let's be honest, sleeping one off from the night before, um, including a good chunk of the crew of the USS Arizona. Right of the of the twenty four hundred uh, service members who were killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor, nearly half of them were aboard the uh, the USS Arizona. Um, those who got up early 
to go to church or whatever tended to <laughs> tended to survive. It was those who were who were asleep when the attack began that uh, uh, that, that suffered the most. So it was a it was a lazy Sunday morning in early December. Uh, no one had any thought that there might be anything anything amiss or that the you know if. if those in the know understood that relations with Japan were bad and that the Japanese were likely to try something. But as I said, that was probably, probably going to attack Singapore or, or, Philipp or the Philippines or, or the Dutch East Indies. The, the idea that they're going to travel a third of the way across the planet and hit Pearl Harbor is ludicrous. When the first Japanese planes break through, what happens? I, you know, initially there's a sense of, of, of disbelief, but uh, there's that famous uh, alert that's sent out, right? Air attack Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. Uh, battles, you know, all, all hands to stations. Uh, and, but importantly, it's a, this is not a drill because otherwise you just said the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. What? And that was a reaction at home as well. One of my favorite stories associated with Pearl Harbor involves the America First Committee. Uh, this was the organization, uh, the leading organization opposed to U.S. involvement in the, in the war. And there was a rally going on in my hometown of Pittsburgh, at the Soldiers and Sailors Hall, a place where I my high school commencement was, in fact. And there was Senator Gerald Nye of, uh, of North Dakota and Senator Burton Wheeler of Montana, and they're giving, getting the crowd fired up about why the United States needs to stay the hell home. And then somebody bursts in at one point and says, the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, he was kind of thrown out of the room. This is this is just a troublemaker because that happened at America First rallies. People showed up to to heckle and make trouble, so they threw him out. And a couple minutes later, somebody handed the speaker at the podium. I think it was Burton Wheeler a message saying, "Yeah, there really has been an attack on Pearl Harbor." So he said, "Well, I guess we have no choice but to fight now." The rally ended. The next few weeks later, the America First committee fold, uh, folded up. There was just nothing to nothing for the uh, for the committee to do now that it was clear that there was war. When did the wind on the base and, and at Pearl Harbor, when did the soldiers and sailors realize this really is an attack and begin to mount any kind of defense at all? Yeah. And what, they, were the, and what right. was the Japanese, they were all dive bombers or what, what was the actual attack and defense? So they were, they, they were a combination of, uh, of fighters, light bombers and torpedo bombers. And, um, yeah, it, it didn't take all. I mean, it, you know, it's 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 hard to mistake what happens once they become once those planes are close enough that they're uh, uh, that they're dropping their bombs and strafing. Uh, then, of course, it 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 was clear what was going on. Uh, getting people to their positions was was a challenge. Part of the big problem was uh, I, I talked about how the U.S. aircraft were deployed. Um, 169 of them were destroyed, almost all of them on the ground. So the United States was not able to really mount any air-to-air -air, uh, defense just because the planes couldn't get, couldn't even get into the air. I, I didn't mention uh, that there was a, uh, there was, there was a, a midget submarine, there was a, a, a few, a handful of Japanese midget submarines operating around the entrance to Pearl Harbor. Their job was if the if the um, if the Pacific Fleet made steam and started to head toward the exit, then these midget submarines were supposed to sink them. Um, the midget submarines were all found and destroyed right right away. That that aspect of the uh, operation was a was a huge failure for the Japanese. But there was no chance for the uh, for the U.S. U.S. ships to get out anyway. So in the end, it didn't it didn't make it. How many ships, uh, remind us, how many American ships are sunk? Yeah. Uh, and what kind of damage, if any, does, do the Americans inflict on the Japanese in defense? Uh, there were only a handful of Japanese aircraft that were, that were lost. Um, the planes returned to the carriers. And there was talk of a second wave. Uh, Admiral Nagumo, who commanded the task force, um, he was concerned that he said, oh, those, those U.S. carriers are out there somewhere. They might find us. So the, the second wave was canceled, which was probably a strategic, which was certainly a strategic uh, uh, mistake on the part of, uh, on the, part of the Japanese. Um, so the Japanese losses were extremely light. U.S. losses, uh, 2,400 service people killed, um, another just under 1,200 injured, 169 aircraft destroyed. 
and six ships were sunk. Four of them were battleships, because the battleships really were the target. There were two smaller craft, a, a mine layer and, a, and, a, and another one. But, but the, the, the big prizes were the four battleships. The Arizona, the Oklahoma, the California, and the West Virginia were all sent to the bottom of the, uh, of the harbor. Now, the last two, the, Calif the California and the West, Virgi West Virginia, were, uh, were eventually saw action again. Here's the thing about attacking enemy ships in port. Uh, the harbor is not all that deep, right? You sink a ship at the high seas, it's gone, right? It's, you know, it's sinking miles under, uh, under there. But, but you know, it, it, a few hundred feet, it, uh, it, it can be raised. So the, the Arizona and the Oklahoma were total losses. Uh, but the California and the West Virginia were raised and rebuilt and saw action against the Japanese before the, uh, before the end of the war. One question, had, one questioner has asked, uh, John, can you expound on the third wave? You mentioned the second wave. What the Japanese argument for or against it? What it would have targeted, and what it would have been, what it would have done yeah. if it were successful? Yeah, those target the the, the targets. Um, yeah, actually, there were two waves. It was the third wave that got that that that, that got canceled. The third wave was supposed to target the uh, uh, the oil storage facilities, the dry dock repair, uh, dry dock repair facilities. In other words, support facilities. Had this attack happened, and these things been been uh, been taken offline, that would have been a huge blow to the U.S. Navy because not only would they have lost those ships, they would have lost the ability to use Pearl Harbor as a major port until those repairs had been made. Had that happened, what was left of the U.S. Pacific Fleet would have had to rebase on the west coast of the United States, which really would have put them far, far from, uh, from, from the action. So the fact that the, the facilities of Pearl Harbor were reasonably untouched uh, really made it easier for the U.S. Pacific Fleet to bounce back and go into action against Japan. Another questioner wants to know, what portion of the Navy was at sea? at the time of the attack? And what portion was there at Pearl Harbor? I don't think I know the answer to that. I know that aside from the carriers, right, like three carriers that were, uh, that were um, either on their way to Midway or on their way back at that point, I don't know how, I, I, my, my suspicion is not very many at all. So that this was a large, large part of the American Pacific Fleet. Yes, and of course, it's 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 important to remember the U.S. had an Atlantic Fleet too. Combine the the U.S. Atlantic and Pacific Fleet together were you know large were certainly larger than the uh, the Japanese force uh, Japanese forces. But but um, part of the reason why the Japanese said that we we've got to attack now is there was a sense of now or never. Uh, the the Japanese enjoyed a, a condition of, of superiority over the Pacific Fleet in late 1941. But the understanding was that's going to change. Uh, the, the Japanese knew how many ships the, Jap the, the Americans were building to add to the U.S. Navy. And uh, the balance was expected to change in, 19, in 1942. So they had to attack now and make the most of the, uh, of the temporary strategic advantage. What's the reaction in Japan and the reaction in the United States? I'm thinking of FDR's war message the next day to Congress, but what's the reaction in Japan to this apparently massively successful attack? And what's the reaction in America? Yeah, there's, there's elation. Uh, the, 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 Japanese are, the, the Japanese are celebrating wildly. And it's important to remember, this is not the only victory for, the, for Japan. I mean, they're, they're, they're attacking on all fronts and winning everywhere for in the days and weeks that follow that follow Pearl Harbor. Uh, there are some who have said that the, that the Japanese um, army and Navy leadership started suffering for what they called victory disease. And they started to think they were invincible. And say, okay, now we've achieved everything we set out to achieve. What's next? Well, do we go to Australia? Do we head into the Indian Ocean? Uh, do we now try to overrun Pearl? Not, not do we try to take take Hawaii? All of those were tasks that were beyond the, the capacity of the uh, the Navy, and especially because the answer of the Japanese was, well, let's try to do all of them. So they kind of divided their forces and sent them in all in all different directions, and that was a, that was obviously a, a, a huge error. Reaction in the United States: absolute outrage. Uh, those who who 
who saw FDR reported that, that he was shaking with rage and surprise, which is one of the reasons why I've never bought into the idea that FDR knew, right? you may have heard this theory that FDR knew of the attack of Pearl Harbor and, and perhaps even invited it. Um, anybody who saw him that day would have said, there's no way that guy knew what was gonna happen because the, 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 the rage and shock on his face was, you couldn't, even, even the greatest actor in the world couldn't fake that. Uh, so he crafted this short to the point speech asking for war he knew he was going to get it right I, I, as i said even the most die hard uh, america first committee member was was willing to go to war you know if the, the country's been attacked you, you got to do it now and 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 that and, and so it was it was it was it was absolutely contrary to japanese expectations that that this would demoralize americans it, <laughs> now it, what i will say one thing FDR did keep the keep information about the extent of the damage secret from the American people for a long time, because FDR himself was 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 afraid that that the American people might be demoralized. Yeah, you in his speech you see him appealing things. He says appealing to the unbounded determination of our people. We will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us God. That's a line from his. Already in the mind, perhaps of unconditional surrender. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I personally think that uh, the decision to insist on absolutes uh, or an unconditional surrender came more out of the need to keep Stalin happy uh, after it was announced in, um, in summer of 1942 or spring of 1942 that there would not be a second front opened in Europe that year. Uh, Stalin saw that as a betrayal FDR, I think, was looking to looking to reassure Stalin that they weren't going to try to cut some deal with the uh, with the Axis powers. Yeah, I, I I I haven't seen anything to suggest that unconditional surrender was on his mind uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. But, it, it does remind me, though, of, of a line I was studying. Alexis de Tocqueville's the description of Americans with students this semester, and he says that Americans are slow to anger, but once offended, have a vindictive temperament. And that many people don't quite understand that about the Americans. They think because they're easygoing most of the time, they're easygoing all of the time. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's uh, that certainly was the was the Japanese impression. It's also the German impression. Uh, Hermann Goering uh, was was once asked, you know, what do you think of the, the Americans? And he said, well, you know, they make good razor blades, because he liked to let razor razor. But but you know that you know, they're good at making stuff, but they, you know they're they're not they're not fighters. What's one great story from us on the American side on the day of the attack of Pearl Harbor or shortly thereafter that speaks in your mind mm. um, to some important aspects of America or the American character? Yeah. Um, probably the story of Dory Miller. Uh, he was a U.S. sailor, a sailor in the, U in the United States Navy. Uh, he was, uh, was African-American. Uh, in fact, he would end up being the first African American awarded the Navy Cross, which is the second highest decoration for valor that's awarded by the uh, by the Navy. Um, so the, he 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 wasn't. I mean, he wasn't trained for combat like most African Americans. He you know he was support roles, you know, working the mess hall or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, but but he when the when the attack happened, he ran to the closest anti-aircraft guns he could find. He was not trained on how to use an anti-aircraft gun, but that didn't stop him from shooting. Uh, I don't know if he hit anything. Uh, and he started tended to, tending to the wounded. I mean, all sorts of things that would have been regarded as uh, above and beyond the call of duty for someone in his, uh, in his station. And he became really the first US war hero of World War II. And, and, and the fact that he was African-American was, you know, was allowed to, uh, that, that made it a good thing for the administration to play up too. Well, uh, one couple last questions here. I'll put a couple of them together. At wanting to know this attack on Pearl Harbor and the Japanese attack, how much influence did the Pearl Harbor attack have on what would come later in the war with internment uh, of the Japanese? Yeah, uh, it, would, it would have considerable impact, uh, especially when it was learned there, there was a, a pilot who had a Japanese pilot who had to bail out, and he took refuge 
in the home of, uh, of, of, of a couple who were of Japanese, uh, of Japanese ancestry, and they harbored him. Um, and this led to the suggestion that, well, maybe we can't trust the Japanese population. Now, interestingly, there was never internment of the, uh, of the Japanese population in Hawaii. Right, there were so many of them; they were necessary for the for the for the uh, uh, just to keep the the economy going. Um, however, there were lots of restrictions placed on them in Hawaii. There there were there were strict curfews, and and they were they were they were closely watched. Uh, on the west coast, where Jap the Japanese were not as important to the local economy, of course, they didn't have that same protection. So they were, yeah, there were there were con there were concerns about uh, about the loyalty of uh, of the local population. And two, a couple more questions to combine for you. This is you've written so many great questions. Um, the Philippines, you mentioned them already. And a couple of questioners want to know how, why, if the Philippines were seen as a likely target, were they so easily overrun? This, of course, this is later. This is in, in 41, 42 and later. And is it true that FDR purposely ignored those territories like the Philippines? Yeah, uh, Douglas MacArthur certainly wanted to put forward the idea that FDR was ignoring them. I think part of it was uh, that the war plans that had been developed as early as 1940 said that if the United States ends up in a war against Japan and, the, and Germany, Germany, we're going to focus on Germany first and stand on the defensive. Right. The, the thought was the Philippines are too far away. They're going to get overrun. We're, we're going to, I mean, if, if the Japanese want them, they're, they're going to take them. Um, in fact, w what was supposed to be defended in the, in, in, uh, in, in the Pacific theater, Alaska, Hawaii, and the Panama Canal. Right? I mean, everything else was considered it. it, it if, if the Japanese are going to take it, they're going to take it because it's more important that we focus on defeating Germany first. In fact, this, this gives you a, a sense of FDR's thinking on this. Again, FDR is convinced that it's the Germans who have put the Japanese up to this. And, uh, and at one point he says, if, if we beat Germany, Japan falls to perhaps without firing a shot. Obviously it was hugely wrong. Um, but the but yeah, but the idea is on their own. The Japanese never would have done this. They're just they they're just being you know, uh, 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 encouraged by the uh, by the Germans. So yeah, it was the so the uh, the plan was to stand on the defensive and focus on Europe. Uh, it it, ha it has to be said in the Philippines, um, Douglas MacArthur, even after learning about the attack on Pearl Harbor really did nothing to secure the B-17s that were located at, at Clark Field. And, and, and an air attack hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor took out almost all of the B-17s on the ground. That was a, I mean, you know, MacArthur had flashes of brilliance in his career, but he also could be pretty boneheaded too. One of your recommendations for great books to read on Pearl Harbor, what are some? Uh, Gordon Prang's "At Dawn We Slept" is probably still the uh, is still the gold standard. Yeah, say that uh, one again for us. Uh, Gordon Prang, P R A N G E, mm -hmm. even though it's pronounced Prang, it looks it's spelled like it's Prang. Gordon, uh, "At Dawn We Slept." Great, John. Thank you so much. This has been really engaging. A great way for us to kind of remember and commemorate this day in American history. And, and the lessons that we can learn from it and that, that you've pointed out to us. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My pleasure, had a great time. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being with us, sharing your afternoon with us as we, again, take a moment to remember this important day for America and the life of our country. If you wanna learn more about Ashbrook, please, if you don't know us, please check us out at ashbrook.org. Or if you're joining us as a teacher, uh, check out teachingamericanhistory.org or just tah.org. Uh, a link to this, uh, to a recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone so you can please view it again, listen again, and of course share it with your friends and family, particularly those with this kind of interest or if you know teachers out there who are teaching uh, American history and especially this, this year in American history, please send that on to them as well. Uh, it's really important. We, we believe at Ashbrook that we can learn from history that really regain historical perspective on 
uh, on ourselves and on the important questions that face us. And frankly, we renew our own understanding uh, of American character and of American principles, exactly of the kind that John talked about today. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us in this conversation and being part of the conversation. We had so many que great questions. Sorry we didn't get a chance to get to them all, but we do appreciate you being here with us and being part of uh, this conversation. Uh, stay safe out there, stay healthy, and as always, stay hopeful and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you for joining us.